to move to our next panel, uh, Designing User-Centric Platforms. And let me introduce you to our moderator and panel chair, Elizabeth Costa. Elizabeth is the Managing Director of the Behavioural Insights Team UK, formerly known as Number 10 Nudge Unit. Uh, Elizabeth's particular expertise is economic policy and digital markets. Joining the team in 2015, um, she has developed and led the team's flagship programs at the intersection of behavioral science and economic policy. She's led dozens of trials and experiments and has also co-authored uh, many papers on consumer decision making in regulated markets and behavioral economy and many more. Um, she's currently a senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics in the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science. Elizabeth, over to you. We're super happy to have you and I'll let you introduce the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. And welcome to this panel on designing user-centric platforms. I have a fantastic panel here with me today, so I'm hoping we're going to have a really interesting and insightful conversation. Um, so I'm going to give a few framing comments about the topic, and then I'm going to introduce each of our panel members and ask them to give you a brief overview of their interest in the topic um, and also some initial insights before we dive into discussion. I'm really pleased we're discussing this topic today. In my mind, how we make decisions online is really one of the most interesting frontiers of behavioural science and decision science. And I wanna start by just framing what I think makes online decisions distinct from decisions that we make offline or in our everyday lives. And I think that will guide some of our discussion today. Um, so I think some of the things that set online platforms and environments apart are that firstly, they're highly curated and deliberately designed. And I'm hoping that um, all of our panelists will be able to offer some insights into how that plays out. That gives us the ability to collect vast amounts of data um, and to also actively experiment on what shapes and influences consumer choice and consumer behavior. Um, and also that can also lead to some imbalance between the knowledge of the platform and the knowledge of the user. Uh, and that has the potential uh, to be used for good where platforms can help us to achieve our own goals, to connect better with each other, to learn, it can also be used, I think, for ill, where there can be a misalignment of incentives between platforms and users. And I'm hoping that Andreas in particular can offer some reflections on where the role of the regulator comes in here. But I'm going to introduce our panelists one by one and then ask them to offer some reflections. Um, so I'm delighted to firstly have Professor Eric Johnson. Eric Johnson is the inaugural holder of the Norman E. Chair of Business, and he is the director of the Center for Decision Sciences at Columbia Business School. Uh, Eric has a new book out, which is called The Elements of Choice. It's an absolutely fantastic read and an excellent reference for anyone who's interested in how to design effective choice architecture. I'm going to go through all the panelists, and I'll, I'll invite their comments. Um, Next, we have Dr. Ezra Ozkan, who is the UX lead at Google. Um, Ezra has been at Alphabet for eight and a half years, um, and following her PhD at M MIT, she became a research and product expert, and she has a wealth of experience in translating those insights into vision, strategy, and design, and I'm sure we'll offer many of those valuable insights today. And finally, we have Dr. Andreas Jesperson, who is the Assistant Director of the Behavioural Hub at the UK Competition and Markets Authority. Andreas joined the CMA from the Danish Competition and Consumer Authority, and he's a behavioural science and public policy international expert, and he has a PhD in behavioural public policy from Roskilde University. So, Andreas, I'm going to turn to you first. Um, if you could give us a bit of background about yourself and your role, um, and also how you come, the angle at which you come at this issue of user-centric design on online platforms. Yeah, thanks Liz, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so obviously I work at a regulator, uh, and specifically a regulator that cares a lot about markets. So basically 
we care about platforms because they are increasingly what what is sort of defining markets today and uh, especially the largest platforms have sort of taken over and grown exponentially now serve as uh, key instruments in how the market evolves um, so this is how we think about platforms and basically we are trying to sort of uphold the, the basic fundamental law of economics market economics that we give you money and you give us valuable services and products and this equation it needs to be like the the answer to this equation needs to fall on a positive side and that's how we think about platforms that's something that is driving immense value we are very happy for the uh, evolution of platforms that's certainly giving consumers in the UK and across the world a lot of value, a lot of indispensable products. We also have a more holistic for approach to user-centric platforms, I think, because we, we not only ask, is this the best platform today, but also is this the be best platform tomorrow and in a year? So we care a lot about stuff uh, that people may not care about when they interact with platforms, sort of like, is, it, is this particular platform uh, making it difficult for other market actors to grow, to, for other people to come into the market? Um, is it causing harm to consumers that they can't see? So basically, uh, uh, is a platform's position in the market so that prices are higher than they could be? And this is often incredibly boring in a sense. It's a lot of economic analysis and market uh, evolution and you know how, how a platform's growing. But but in the end, uh, I think our role is to think very carefully about often minute details such as consent and active choice and these things and how are options presented on a platform. And then think about, you know, in the grand scheme of things, what does, it mean, what does this mean for users today and tomorrow and for other market actors coming into the market in 10 years um, and making sure that as much value as possible is created when we go and buy stuff on these platforms or interact with the platforms, social media, and so on. Um, so basically, when we think about user-centric platforms, I think we think both about, is it easy for customers and consumers to engage with the platforms, but also what are the consequences of their actions in a much broader scheme and uh, for other actors in that market. Fantastic, thank you. Ezra, I'm going to turn to you for some opening comments. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I am, uh, as Liz mentioned, I'm a product and research, I'm a product and design researcher uh, with expertise in creating human-centered technologies. Uh, my PhD was in a field called science, technology, and society. And uh, since then, I've been really interested in understanding how so technology and society interact and shape each other. Currently, I work as a research lead at Google um, and establishing a specialized research unit called the Choice Lab uh, to focus on how understanding how can our users make decisions and choices and how to design the best solutions to address this. Um, and in general, I think my role has to do with helping create um, products that users love and that can help them achieve their goals and make their lives easier. In terms of um, a couple of insights on user-centric um, user centered platforms, I think often um, our users have a range of options to accomplish a task. Each product has different functionalities, features, and our job as UX professionals is to really figure out how we can present these choices to our users um, within different products. Um, I would say two things that drive that approach is one is contextuality. And that has to do with every time we think about choice, we have to think about it in the context of user needs and goals. So what is the user trying to accomplish and what role does the choice play in that path um, and also um, how can we present choices that are relevant to users context and that includes all the way from users literacy tech literacy level languages they speak maybe devices they use and even the level of internet connectivity they have and the second i think main principle that we uh, that is at the core of the way we think about design in general with choice design in, pre in particular is an iterative design approach that is data driven and um, 
to ensure that what we think are the right solutions are actually the right solutions, uh, because in the abstract, what we think is going to work for users may not work in the end. So an iterative process, uh, a two-way process between design and research, where research informs design, design gets tested, um, and then gets reiterated until we find the optimum solution. And um, with that, I am going to turn it back to you. Fantastic. Thank you. Eric, over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, I thought I'd start by defining what choice architecture is, since that's not a word everyone knows. It's pretty simple, really. Every time we make a choice, someone hasn't been there before us. We've had a hidden partner who's made a bunch of decisions. Let me give you one kind of fun example, which is a dating site. You go to a dating site and somebody's decided how many dates to show you, what attributes to describe the people on, um, what order to put them in, you know, what size pictures. All those things we know are going to change the dates you have. And that person who you can call a choice architect or a designer is going to influence your life. And that's a definition of choice architecture that I think is sort of interesting because it's important. And we all sort of realize it on one level, but we never think about the choice architect. Now, platforms are pretty magical. And that's a good example because you have many more decisions you can make as a designer than you would if you were doing a, a regular physical store. Uh, just to give you a couple examples. One is you can give users control. They can decide to sort. Maybe in our dating site, they could sort by distance away. Um, they can customize, they can decide they want to see some information or the site can customize given the data that the site knows ab about people. And finally, something that's often overlooked is a site can help your comprehension of the options. So for example, when you, I've done a lot of work looking at consumer finance, you know, I can help you understand what uh, a deductible is in health insurance. I can actually play the role of an instructor if I'm a designer. Now, I'm a psychologist. I've been studying for many years um, these issues. One example to think about is the default. That is the option that happens if you don't make an active choice. And some of my most famous research is looking at the role of defaults in organ donation. That's been a big issue in much of Europe and obviously in, in the UK. Um, now, online, that plays a big role. Um, and you see it in privacy policies. You see it in... Retail sites where defaults might be set for shipping and sometimes have hazardly. So these are very powerful tools that I think both consumers often don't realize has an influence on their behavior. So that's an important point. And a second point is sometimes designers don't realize how important it is. I'll end with one very quick story. We did some work for a large German uh, auto manufacturer, upscale cars, and they'd set the defaults for all their choices on their configurator to the cheapest option. Now that was bad for them because people bought cheaper cars, but it's also bad for consumers because if you've ever been on the Autobahn, you know you don't want a small engine when someone's passing you at 200 kilometers an hour. So it was basically a lose-lose proposition that was made by not appreciating the effect of design on consumer behavior. I'll turn it back to you after that. I mean, that's a great example and, and a brilliant definition of, of what choice architecture is as a different levers. Um, can I put it back to you, Eric, and then to the other panelists on what makes great user-centered design or great and effective choice architecture? What are the elements of that? So, I mean, I think UX design often em emphasizes a really important point, which is making the experience feel good to the consumer. The second part that comes from sort of the study of judgment and decision-making, which is making sure people make the right choice. I could feel great about a choice and it turned out not to be very good. So. Often there's this tension between choice quality and the experience of making the choice. What I, I think about is fluency, how it, easy it is to make the choice and choice quality, how accurate the choice is. So I think that balance is important. And I don't think people actually can tell you what an accurate choice all, is all the time. We, we've heard the word goals and that's true. Goals are there, but goals can be affected by the choice architecture. So it's a little bit more complicated than you know, simply making people happy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Ezra, I'd like to turn to you at, at Google. How do you think about that balance between um, what increases the satisfaction and that feel good uh, sense amongst your users? And how do you think about what might be the right choices for them, including the heterogeneity of your users and how you yeah. put that in? Yeah, um, it's a great 
questions and, and that's a great question and i think there's a few questions there um so i think um I mean, we want to enable users to make informed choices and engage choices and the right choices, but we also want to make sure that users aren't overloaded uh, with the number of choices they have to make throughout the day. And it's not just Google that they are interacting with throughout the day. They have many other ecosystems they go in and out of. And so I think we want to, first of all, balance that um, emotional feeling of overload, anxiety over making the right choices and such, uh, with making the right choices at the right time. So I think there are three primary questions that we try to ask, um, which is all centered around a user goal, um, so that we can actually provide the right choices in the context of the user goal. And the first one is how do we design the right appropriate solution, design solutions? Because we know choice may create a friction either because it interrupts the task or because there are too many choices to make. But does this choice actually, how can we sort of balance the friction that this choice moment creates with the impact that the choice has? And the second one is where and when we present these choices so that they are most effective and useful. And the third is coming back to your question around like the multiplicity of user groups is what choices do we provide to the users um, that are relevant to their context, that are relevant to the languages they speak, that are relevant to their tech literacy. Um, and this all, I think, um, requires a iterative research process um, that doesn't just look at the usability um, but also usefulness of choices, so that these choices really help users achieve their goals in the most effective manner. Measure not just the behavioral aspects, but also the sentiments and attitudes users have about what choices they have to make throughout the day, the number of them, the frequency of them, the persistence of them, um, and also uh, test our solutions with multiple user groups, because we, I think, taking um, thinking about our users as the monolithic group of users um, is detrimental um, to the solutions. So we want to make sure that we can, all the way from age groups to um, educational levels and more, but making sure that there are multiple groups that are being researched and designed for. And can you give us some examples of where you think you've got those three things really right in the design of Google's platforms? And if you're comfortable, an example of where you think you might not quite have the balance right. Um, I could um, I could maybe give an example um, of search, uh, where I think uh, many of us rely on it and billions of users along around the world. Um, in terms of uh, how do we design the appropriate solution and provide the right choices, uh, we have um, millions of resources that we could provide to users. Um, and in that sense, if the users are asking, for example, uh, for factual information, like directions to a hospital, and then one could say, we don't maybe need to show the same information from 15 different providers. So they don't need to get a factual information uh, to reach uh, a hospital. So that's maybe where we are going to put the choices in the background and because the accuracy of the results is what's most important to the user at that point. Um, but if the same user, let's say, is looking for um, a used car, going back to the car example, then that's when comparing results and uh, different deals uh, dealerships uh, will be important and that's where we're going to introduce the choices to users. Um, so I think based on um, what the users is trying to accomplish and what in the first case and in accurate information the quickest way possible, the second one having a range of options so that they can make an informed decision based on their budget and preferences. I think that's maybe where we um, do a good job. In terms of where we may need to do a little bit more work is, um, is for example, the we have many products. Uh, so how do we actually like keep 
choice preferences coherent across these products is not something that we have, I think, yet done much work in. Um, so that users don't have to make the same choices again and again. So how do we in some ways respect the privacy of users, considering some devices are personal, some devices are public in the, in the are shared in the same household? And how do we yet respect the choices that users make so that um, we're able to maintain them in, in, the, um, in, in a time-saving manner for the users with that, uh, with that making them feel like their privacy is being compromised? Really interesting, thank you. Um, Andre, if I want to come back to you and explore this idea of the right choice for the for the user. How do you think about that as a regulator and how do you balance um, the interests of the user with um, the interests of the platform and the broader market and competition dynamics? Yeah, that's a that's a difficult question because it, it often shifts from, I guess, market to market. Um, but obviously uh, we wanna, so, a very important part of our work is respecting that people have a like there's a plurality of preferences. Uh, users are not the same. Con consumers are not similar necessarily, and we want sort of a market that can cater to many many different types of wants and needs. Um, so basically, I think we have a pretty common sense way of thinking about this that um, users want to at least in on reflection to have privacy. And if that's the order of the business, they want to get great products for you know, as, as little as possible, maybe not cars in Germany, but on, on general, in general, we want to pay as little as possible for the best possible products. Um, so we, I think we respect what people, like we, we respect and ask obviously people, you know, what, what they want. Um, and it's our role to then think about how this translates when people interact with, with platforms and the consequences of their actions and interactions with platforms, and then try to sort of extrapolate the consequences on a societal level from that interaction. So, um, so there is a little bit of sort of going beyond just what people say they want. Um, we need to think about how, you know, as an individual consumer, you might not care a whole lot about what, you know, that the a company collects or a platform collects your data, but this fuels then the next link. It fuels that business's search platform, that business's ad tech, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to go a bit beyond and, and, and think about how, how, you know, everyday choices and everyday preferences turns into these colossal products in the end, simply because millions and millions of users interact with these platforms. Um, so basically, we don't, we're not in the business of sort of telling people what they should want, but we do want them to get as far as little as possible. Thank you. Um, I want to come back to the tools of user design and choice architecture. Um, Eric, can I turn to you and, and ask you firstly, which of those levers do you think are the most powerful? but also which do you think are the most underutilized as well? Um, it's interesting because I think almost everybody thinks of defaults as the poster child of choice architecture, but I think they're good and they actually vary in effectiveness depending upon the setting. But there are other things that I think people don't realize that are very powerful and you know, sort of without doing too much of a Sophie's choice, which of my children are, are the most powerful, but among other things are sorting what is first makes a big difference in some settings. My favorite example is in the US election, it turns out even for president, whoever's first in the ballot gets a 1% increase in share. You know, and we know that on online settings, it's a very nice work on order effects on hotel rooms choice. So that's a very powerful, um, very powerful tool. But other things like how, even just how you describe an attribute. Um, a favorite example of mine describing uh, ground beef is either 7% lean or 30% fat. It's the same thing, but even those labels can be very powerful. So there's a big array and what makes it even more interesting is they interact. So having one label can make sorting different. And so it's actually a, a hard thing to say what's best, but it's way beyond just defaults. And what about friction? Because I'm actually, so you might see from, I don't know how 
clearly you can see my background, but I'm I'm just I'm at the Shard in London today, teaching at Warwick Business School, um, and I've been teaching students this morning about the power of friction, both stripping it out of processes, but also adding it in intelligently. Um, can I can you comment on where you think there should be more or less friction in online platforms? So I, I it's it's a great question because I think friction happens at the beginning of a decision. So the analogy I use is your GPS when you're driving. You put in a route, you say, I'll take that. And then you almost never choose that because you're then busy driving. In decision-making, we often decide how we're going to make a decision. And then we never change that because we're too busy making a decision to sort of revisit that. So the question is basically, the frictions are going to have their most influence at the very beginning. So just to use one example, which is relevant, uh, if I go to one more website and ask today, how do I want to manage my cookies? When my goal at that time is to book a flight or to you know, order a new book, that's creating a friction to what I want to do and therefore I dismiss it. Now that's a serious issue. So Andreas would probably say that's something that um, is important for the market as a whole. S would say that may be the wrong time to ask that question. Now, it's because of friction that's the wrong time. It's an important decision. How can we get people to make that once across sites? That would be my claim. So that's a good example, at least in my mind, of, of where friction is keeping people from making an important choice. Yeah, I really love that example. Andreas, Ezra, what do you think? Um, yeah, I'll start. Um, so I think, I think friction is really interesting. Like it's an interesting thing also from a, like from, for us as regulators to think about. Uh, so in traditional economics, I mean, simply going to the store is kind of a necessary evil for people to get what they want. So in so economics land, we want people to get their products almost instantaneously. So, um, and obviously throughout time, this has been the way, like friction has been a natural part of our process. We had to go to the store, we had to wait in line, we had to go to the post office to pay our bills, all these things. And now with the evolution of digital platforms and uh, evolution of digital online choice architecture, we are seeing sort of the ev evaporation of friction in many instances. We, we pay for stuff without even paying attention to it. Um, and I think we've, we are beginning to see some of the um, some of the negative sides of removing a lot of friction from the markets. So we recently had a, uh, we had work on subscriptions where we saw people paying for years for stuff they didn't really think about, or maybe didn't use, didn't want. Um, we see in certain markets that people get products with great consequences, maybe too fast. Um, so different types of financial products. Uh, we can also think about how this move from sort of one-to-one -one interactions every time we buy something towards a more subscription-based economy. How's that affecting our tendency to evaluate products and compare them between different providers? This is something where I think we feel that obviously we don't want more friction than we need, but we might need a little bit of friction. Uh, and we need to be very strategic because we also recognize that adding friction to businesses interface is a cost. Something I, uh, Esther can correct me here, but something that businesses hate us doing, uh, sort of is getting directly into that to product development and telling them, you know, oh no, people must wait a bit here or you need more information here. Uh, so we need to be extremely, I think, um, careful about how we use friction, but I think we will be thinking more strategically about friction in the future. Um, I certainly hate that. I certainly don't hate that uh, you uh, have a very thoughtful uh, approach to this, and I am actually um, looking forward to that. We're going to be thinking about this together, because I do agree it's a really difficult decision. Um, and back to your question, Lizanne, um, what's a bad example of choices? I think cookie consent is a terrible ex example of that. We all want our privacy to be, ex to be respected. And I think we had the regulators had the right intentions and, and wanted companies to do something about it. But the solution came, we came up with collectively uh, is a terrible experience. So in the past, we just didn't 
click any buttons and we supposedly shared the information that we didn't want to share with companies. And now we just accept cookies either because it's a prominent choice or it's just an annoyance and there's no time to read and customize what information we share with platforms versus we don't. So we have we still are in the same place from a privacy perspective, I think, except that we have more friction. And that's, I don't think that's what companies want, users want, or regulators want. Um, that's why I think the, the question around friction um, has to be balanced with impact. And um, what I mean by that is, is like, why does the choice appear? Um, back to Eric's point about like at the beginning of the journey in the middle of it to interrupt the user who's trying to get to the hospital because the search engine is asking which map provider they want to use to get to the hospital. Uh, so where does choice appear? And how complex is it to make the choice? How many choices are there to make? And what's the frequency uh, and persistence of choice? So those are the friction pieces. And then there's the impact, which is basically, does this choice help me to make uh, my decision in an effective way um, and, and help me get to where I want to get to? We don't go to the store to go to the store. We go to the store. Uh, a choice is a means, not an ends in itself. And how easy to change the choices when we set them up. Um, so in some ways, um, we want to deliver the like highest return on choice by balancing choice friction and choice impact. And sometimes it would mean that we actually pose and slow down the user and give them a moment to read an important text about the information that they're about to share with the platform. And we create a friction, but we do create a friction that is actually purposeful and serves a good purpose. And sometimes if it is a choice that could be later changed easily or doesn't have as much impact on users, users lives or the tasks they're trying to accomplish, then we put it in the background. We make it accessible, but we don't interrupt the user. And because it's so contextual and nuanced, I, that's why I think we do need a lot of um, research and move it from the abstract and take it to where the choice is taking place and what purpose should it serve. And maybe I can, can draw you on that point on research because I, I absolutely agree. and. I think there's so much for us all to learn collectively about how we make choices and behave online. And I wonder how you see your role within Google and how Google sees its role within society as, as an, a company that can generate and share some of that research more broadly. Um, do you, I guess the question is, do you see it as a private good for Google to understand how users behave on its platform or do you see that as a public good for us all to build a knowledge and an understanding of, of online decision making? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we have already started. Um, and some of this research is already available, not just on choice, but uh, a lot of the research that we conduct is available. And I do feel like in this field, particularly, we are really keen on uh, not reinventing the wheel, first of all. Um, there are amazing, there's amazing literature um, in behavioral sciences, economics, legal fields. Um, so first of all, really building on it um, and um, building on that great foundation. Um, and then I think um, adding our piece, um, our piece as in adding the kind of research that we can conduct with our users on our platforms, um, but also, um, and we are really keen on partnering with Andrea's team um, so that um, we can actually combine our forces because I do think eventually academic scholars, practitioners, and regulators have the same end goal in mind, but we do see different parts of the, uh, of the picture. Um, so in that sense, I'm really also keen on finding ways to uh, conduct research collectively that we can't possibly conduct on our own um, and find ways in which we can actually um, share this research uh, while protecting business secrets, while protecting our the participants' privacy and such. But I am confident that um, we can reach a place where we are conducting meaningful research and, um, and learning so that we can um, reach that common goal. 
Fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got about seven minutes left and each of you has, has made reference to the future and the evolution of digital platforms. And I'd like to turn back to each of you and ask, what do you think the platforms of the future can and should look like? And particularly from the perspective of user-centric design. Eric, can I start with you? Well, I, sure. Um, here, here's the thing. I think many people, and I see in the chat questions like, is choice architecture ethical? And two points, because I think it is important to get, first is there's no such thing as a neutral choice architecture. That is, there has to be a choice architecture. So let me use one example. I'm not picking on Google in particular, but it's actually a very great example. They have a great site called Google Flights that I use all the time. And they've made a decision, a very interesting decision, to actually include the carbon emissions for the flights. Now, that's very, that's going to have an influence. So there's no neutral. You either have that or you don't have that. You know, you might think it's a nudge. Not having that is a nudge. It makes me, even if I want to be more sustainable, it makes it hard for me to do that. So that's a, an example. So I think the notion is that people worry about choice architecture as manipulation, but it also can be a very powerful tool for the good. I don't mean just it promotes sustainability. It can help me generate my goals. So it could actually generate a choice set that is specific for me or a default that's specific for me based on what it knows. Now that can also go bad, but it's clearly, I think the notion that the choice architecture is a partner in making a better choice is where platforms are going. Um, saying, to essentially making people are opinions of people a little bit more modest. You know, they aren't as great a decision makers as perhaps economics makes us think they are and help them make better decisions. One last quick example. Um, it turns out when you give people a choice of credit cards and tell them, here's what you're going to do, we show that only about 40% of people get it right. There's a huge opportunity there to help people make better choices. Um, and, you know, and hopefully a company that figures out how to do that can actually increase their market share and make some money at the same time. Absolutely. And also to where that underlying choice remains complex to help people navigate that choice as right. well. Fantastic. Um, Andreas, what do you think is in the, what are the best platforms for the future to use your phrase from your introduction? The best platforms for the future, uh, without naming any specific platforms from the from the present, um, I think the best platforms for the future are ones who think about consumer and user welfare holistically, and who take a, I think, a more protective view on uh, how consumers interact once they are at a platform. I think increasingly we are seeing platforms who shape large parts of everyday people's lives, uh, what, we, you know, what we buy, what we watch, who we talk to and how. Um, and I, I think having a, having a stronger sense of responsibility for users is something we'll see in the future. I think if, if not out of their, the goodness of their heart, then because regulation will evolve and, and sort of force businesses to be more holistically when they, when they interact. So, and I mean this in very practical terms, like not just asking because you have to out of regulation, but designing good questions for their users. You know, how do you want your privacy settings? What type of products do you want to be shown? All these things that we can sort of play whack-a-mole today and put in paragraphs here and there, you know, mandating businesses how they must interact with businesses or with consumers. But I think in the future, we will have regulation that sort of puts it on the platform and enables us to put it on the platform, you know, what good our choice architecture actually looks like. And then let's platforms um, do what they're best to, which is basically designing really, really good choice architecture, but keeping in mind this more holistic approach to consumer welfare. Thank you. Ezra, over to you. Um, plus one to and what Andrea said in terms of user welfare and consumer welfare. Um, hopefully platforms are going in a direction, uh, ideally will go in a direction where they are trying to optimize user welfare, not just because of the solutions that they provide and the choices they, meaningful choices they present, but also um, I think um, there's going to be more accountability um, 
end. And I think that is not just a regulatory push, I think, but also I think users are getting more empowered and informed, which is amazing. And um, so I think companies are going to willingly um, and some unwillingly perhaps, um, going to take that also as a reference point and that accountability um, because users have choices on any any platform. Users have cho have choices to choose another. So I think in that sense, like whether or not you're empowering your users in the right way, will be a, almost a selling point, I think, and there will be more accountability and responsibility on the side of um, users. Um, so in that sense, better design, a more powerful user experience effective solutions and doing it in a responsible manner where we are respecting users' attention, <laughs> users' privacy, I think are going to be matters of, um, of consumer choices. So I think uh, there, I, I am, I'm seeing more accountability on the rise in that sense. Really interesting. Um, in keeping with the, the theme of the conference as a whole, I'm going to ask you all to wrap up with just one sentence and completing the sentence in the future, digital platforms will. Ezra, can I start with you? Uh, will be more complex um, and require uh, experts from multiple fields to to improve. Honestly, that's why I am I'm. Uh, keen on being part of this panel. I am keen on continuing these conversations. Um, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Andreas. In the future, digital platforms will uh, be more responsible. Mm -hmm. Great. And Eric, what do you think? Um, help improve consumer decision and consumers' welfare. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to my panelists, to Eric, to Andreas and to Ezra. You've all brought very different and interesting perspectives to this discussion and um, thank you very much.